and we'd like to hear from you with comments uh, on the program, what you like, what you think can be improved, and your ideas for future programs. Please give us a call. The number's there on your screen, area code 213-252-4088. That's 213-252-4088. Call us with your comments and ideas. We look forward to hearing from you. I'm Paul Peterson for the Los Angeles Department of Aging, the people here at City View Channel 35, and all of our guests on Aging in L.A. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you next time.
Good morning, Los Angeles, and welcome to the City Council meeting for Tuesday, the 9th of November, 2010. We're here in the John Farrell Council Chamber of Room 340 of City Hall. We meet here every Tuesday, Wednesday, and Friday at 10 a.m., and I want to welcome those viewers and members of the public who are joining us today. Uh, we are uh, here with Council Members Krikorian, Labonge, Perry, and Rosendahl, who are here on time. Uh, Miss, um, Mr. Zine is out today, and Mr. Parks is excused to arrive late, so the rest of the council members are now tardy. Council members Alicone, Cardenas, Hahn, Wiesar, Koretz, Reyes, Smith, and Wesson, if you'll please join us. That's Alicone, Cardenas, Hahn, Wiesar, Koretz, Reyes, and Wesson. Um, we are broadcast live on Channel 35 throughout the city's cable system, and welcome our viewers on Channel 35, which broadcasts us live and rebroadcasts us uh, in the evening times for your convenience. And we're also available three other ways, in person in Van Nuys or San Pedro at our city hall chambers there. And you can also testify from there as well, and we're able to watch you here from downtown. Um, we're also available through the city's homepage, which is www.lacity.org. Um, we can catch live streaming webcasts of our council meetings, and we archive all of our past council meetings. Also available online there are uh, links to city departments and various ways you can improve the quality of life in your community, and all the supporting materials, including our agendas for these meetings. All the reports for items of interest are available to the public, just as they are to council members and our staffs. Um, and finally, you can call in using your telephone and listen into our council meetings at 213-621-CITY. Uh, so. Uh, those are the different ways you can follow your city council in action. Um, we have cards available here and also in San Pedro and Van Nuys city council chambers for public testimony. Our agendas are split into items that have already had a hearing uh, in committee. Those require a council member to reopen to hear uh, anybody from the public. But for items that have not yet had a public hearing and are agendized for a public hearing, if you just fill out a speaker card, hand it one of the city staff or sergeants at arms, we'll be sure to hear your comments on that item today. Finally, we have a part of the meeting for general public comment. That's for items not on the agenda, but nevertheless under the jurisdiction of the City Council. And again, two minutes per speaker. We'd be happy to hear your comments. Just fill out a card and put public comment in the upper right corner. Thank you to Council Members Han, Krikorian, Labonge, Perry, Rosendahl, and Smith who are here. Uh, that is uh, seven members. Mr. Wesson makes eight. We need ten members to constitute a quorum or two-thirds of our 15-member body. So we're still awaiting the following late council members. Council Member Alicon, Cardenas, Wizar, Koretz, and Reyes. Council Members Alicon, Cardenas, Wizar, Koretz, and Reyes. Uh, we will begin the meeting as soon as we have them. If we do not have a quorum, we'll adjourn for lack of a quorum. Thank you to members of the public for your patience in the meantime. Now 1010. Uh, this is our third quorum call for council members Alicon Cardenas, Wizar, Koretz, and Reyes. If they'll please make their way to council immediately. Mr. Wiesar, we're waiting one more member to begin the meeting. Council members Alicorn, Cardenas, Tourette's and Reyes. Please call the roll. 
Alec Concardus, Han, Weezer, Koretz, Roy, and LaBanche Parks, Perry, Reyes, Resnall, Smith, Weston, Zahn, Garcetti. Ten members present and a quorum is president. First order of business, please. Approval of the minutes. All right, Mr. Uh, Reyes moves and Mr. Kerkorian seconds without objection. Those will be approved. Next order of business. Commendatory resolutions for approval. All right, Mr. LaBanche moves and Ms. Han seconds without objection. Those will be approved as well. If I can please ask everybody in chambers to rise for our Pledge of Allegiance, which we do every Tuesday. And Ms. Hahn, would you be kind enough to uh, lead us in the pledge? Janice, will you lead us? Will you lead us? Yeah. Uh, thank you. Please join me in uh, pledging allegiance to our flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Ms. Hahn. If we can run through uh, today's agenda, please. Colleagues, if you'll direct your attention to items you'd like to call special. Um, and we are still awaiting 12 members, so co Council Members Alicone and Cardenas and Coretz, uh, when they are here, will be able to consider the ordinances. So let's hold items 1 through 9. and go. To the Mr. President, before beginning the regular agenda, there's a number of items to be continued. Okay. Uh, the first one, uh, there's a request to continue items 18 and 22 to November 17th. Is there any objection to continuing 18 and 22 until the 17th of this month? Seeing none, we'll go ahead and uh, approve those. There's a request to continue item 58 one day to November 10th. All right, we'll continue that until the 10th if there's no objection till tomorrow. Uh, there is a request to refer items 37, 52, and 55 uh, back to the Housing Committee. Okay. There's no objection to those. Uh, we'll go ahead and refer those three to HCED committee. And so the final we'll, item, there's a request to refer item 38 back to the ITGA committee. Without objection, we'll go ahead and continue that as well. Uh, oh, sorry, we refer that to ITGA. First items on the agenda, items 1 through 9 are street lighting district items, notice for public hearing, and there is now 12 members. Do we have any cards on those? There are no cards. Okay. Let's go ahead and open the roll on those if nobody wishes to call those special. Close the roll and tabulate the vote. Twelve eyes. Those are approved. Next items, please. Items 10 through 30 are building and safety liens notice for public hearing. The department reports that items 11, 14, and 16 may be received and filed in as much as those liens have been paid. Okay, without objection, we'll go ahead and receive and file those. Any cards on these? There are no cards. Okay. Any specials, colleagues, 10 through 30? Seeing none, let's go ahead and open the roll. Close the roll and tabulate the vote. Twelve eyes. Those are approved. Next items, please. Items 31 through 49 are items to which public hearings have been held. Okay. Anybody wishing to call any of these special? Ms. Hahn? 31. 31 for Ms. Hahn. 48. Mr. 38? 48. Oh, 48. 48 for Mr. Rosendahl. Any other specials, colleagues? 31 through 49. Going once, going twice. Let's go ahead on the balance then. Oh, Mr. Kretz? One columns? Yes. Uh, 31, yeah, Ms. Oh, Hahn, call yes, that okay. special. Let's go ahead and open the roll on the balance then. Close the roll and tabulate the vote. 12 ayes. Those are approved without objection. Let's send 46 forthwith, please. Next items. Items 50 through 58 are items for which public hearings have not been held. Ten votes are required for consideration. Okay, no objection. Well, those are uh, before us now for consideration. Um, any specials, colleagues, on items 50 through 58? 50 through 58. Do we have any cards on any of these? There are no cards, Mr. Okay, we'll President. Close the public hearings on those. If not, let's t take up. Yep. We'll take up the balance. Please open the roll. Close the roll and tabulate the vote. 12 ayes. These are approved. Let's send 51 and 53 forthwith without objection. And that will take us to our general public comment. Bill Huey is our first speaker. Uh, good morning, members of the L.A. City Council. My name is Bill Huey. I'm the president of the Fair Housing Coalition. We're a landlord rights organization. Last week I spoke about the unfair billing that the housing department does. Landlords all over the city are paying their fees on time, and, and they have a canceled check to prove that they were on time. Then they get letters that they were late, and there's a 300% interest, and then it gets turned over to a collection agency, and it just, it's, it's, it's like a criminal empire, and there's no outreach 
program at the housing department to deal with fair-minded landlords. I have another member of my coalition. He operates pristine buildings in San Pedro. I mean, his buildings you could eat off the floor. What happened is he got a tenant in there who knows all the tricks and knows that if you break things in the apartment and you don't let the landlord in to fix it, you can call the housing department and the housing department comes in, they cite the landlord, they threaten to put him in a reap, and there's no outreach program. There's nobody at the housing department. There's no department that an ethical landlord can call up and say, look, I got a crazy tenant. I just fixed everything in the apartment. Come, send an inspector, take a look, take a picture. Then a week later, this tenant breaks it again because they've had contacts with these contractors who teach tenants how to keep a building in a reap. And these people make a career out of getting free rent and then suing the landlord. There has to be some major modification of the LA Housing Department because as I speak in the media about this, I'm getting letters from landlords all over and I'm getting letters from law firms that say, let's hold seminars and let's create a hundred lawsuits for the city. I don't want to go down that road. I believe ethical-minded people can solve it. But here's a gentleman who has pristine buildings. He's got a tenant from hell living in there. She breaks things. He sends her certified mail that he wants to come in and fix it. He obeys the law. And when he calls the housing department, they give him a cold attitude. But when she calls, they send inspectors out to threaten him, send him letters, and tell him they're going to have a general manager's here. Where is that building, sir? Hmm? Where is that building so we can make it's sure the right... It's in San Pedro in okay. Councilman Hans' office. Well, we'll have somebody... If she'll talk to me on the you. side, I'll give sure. her the information. We'll, we'll make sure that somebody from her staff comes I really comes want to work this out with the city, you know? Thank you. We appreciate that. We'll make sure you get the uh, okay. uh, right council staff to talk to you. Daniel Gus is our next speaker. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, first of all, I wanted to thank Dennis Zine for working on a very uh, important piece of uh, humane, uh, uh, closing a humane loophole in the city. Hopefully, City Council will approve that very soon. So thanks to Dennis Zine and Christopher Olson for working on that. But I'm here today to uh, show you this article from Downtown News. Uh, I commented on this last Friday from Van Nuys, but it's important that I came. Want, I wanted to come down here today also. Uh, in about a month, uh, the city is going to lose downtown dog rescue. Uh, the property where it's located is moving to Vernon, where they do not have animal kenneling. And um, this is a gem of a charity. It's not my charity, so you know that I'm just speaking from the heart. Downtown Dog Rescue has provided hundreds of thousands of dollars of free spay-neuter shots microchips, and in some instances, um, uh, jobs even for some homeless people uh, in the downtown area. Um, if any of the council members in the southern and eastern portions of the city, maybe Mr. Huizar, or Mr. Reyes, or Mr. Parks, Mr. Wesson, and uh, Ms. Perry, if you have a blighted property or an empty property, and you want a world-class animal charity to stay in the city, please um, uh, read this article, and my business card's attached to it, or I can hook you up with Downtown Dog Rescue. It's, a, it's an incredibly important charity. And I thank you for whatever you could possibly do to keep them in the city. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gus. Uh, Miriam Fogler in Van Nuys is our next speaker. Then Candy Damaris back here in Chambers. I'm on the fine line now. Yes, I wanted to let you know, we came here, as you were finishing up with your, going through the agenda, we put in our cards for 52 and 55, so we'd like to have that up for reconsideration, not to be sent to the mayor, please. We'd like to have a hearing on that. Go, go ahead, ma'am, for public comment right now. Those were actually uh, referred back to committee, so there's no public hearing on those at all today. But go ahead with your general public comment. Thank you. Oh, can I have my time back? Because that was, that was business of dealing with the ca calling of the agenda. This is why, uh, folks, why you lost. And, it's, and California is going to go down in the tube. It's going to go down in the down, down, down. You people are going to be all in trouble because of Proposition 25. What you did was a major chutzpah. Very bad. You gave the politicians not an easier time to balance the books, but a harder time to balance books. It's not going to be a balanced budget on time, folks. Matter of fact, I think it's going to be longer. And if anything, they'll find any way they can to raise taxes. There's no money there. No money at all. And I challenge Jerry Brown right now, because I don't think he's an attorney. He's a he doesn't have a, a, a license to, to practice law. 
he started all this uh, problem in the state, the, uh, the uh, deficit. So you guys are going to end up with the uh, biggest deficit while the rest of the country woke up. You want to have it? You got it. You got you. You go ahead and keep on spending. Go ahead. Go ahead and keep on spending. Spend, spend, spend. Tax, tax, tax. Spend, spend, spend. It's easy for politicians to spend other people's money, but their own. And don't forget, folks, they're going to pay themselves money because they're going to appropriate money in their own expense account. So it's not going to be a problem for them. Not a problem at all. None whatsoever. You guys gave it real easy for them. Prop 22, same thing. Won't be any money there, but they'll just find a way to tax more and more. They'll be taxing you out of your existence here. So when you, when you need me, you'll be coming back to me for help. You'll be crawling back. Thank you very much. Candido Mars is our next speaker. After that will be uh, Roland Guevara. Good, good morning, Mr. President, Council Members. Can you hold my time till I pass these out? Um, I need these passed out, Mr. Go ahead. We'll make sure that Sergeant Arm takes it, but go Thank ahead. Thank you, Mr. President. You bet. Um, I, I want to talk about the article that was in the Daily News. Again, it was about DWP and the uh, procurement process and the fact that uh, credit cards. Mr. Uh, President, can I have your attention, sir? Thank you. I appreciate your, uh, about the credit card issue. In 2004, you set up a small business advisory committee to take a look at that. That was one of the issues that was brought before us. And in this packet, you'll see that that was given to our committee, the, the, the uh, policies and procedures of a DWP and the, the spending that was taking place. Nothing was done at that time. A young lady by the name of Sandra Miranda came before you and asked that you support her in this fight to stop the corruption at DWP. The only one did, that did was Miss Janice Hahn. Miss Hahn, again, you were a hero to those people that fought corruption at DWP. You called the person that came before your committee, Mr. Carnes's committee, and called him a liar because he lied. He had the audacity to lie to you. He had no respect for this institution. So I want you to take a look at this packet, because as you go through this packet, you'll see that after six years, I'm still having to make that fight. You folks appointed me to that committee. DWP acknowledged in 2009 that I saved them over $2 million, and yet nothing is done. Why haven't I had your support? All I've asked from you folks is to step in. I have saved, that was for one, that was for one year, from 2004 to 2000. Uh, Ten, we've so probably spent about uh, saved about fifteen million dollars. I took a lie detector test. Two of them, one at DWP, and asked, was asked, was I offered a contract? Was I offered a bribe? And I passed that uh, lie detector test. So again, I'm submitting this to you folks so that you can take a look at this. That this was an issue that you folks were looking at many, many years ago. And I thank you finally for putting the pressure. And Mr. Uh, President, if I may, just one second, please. Let's let's finally finish this. Their policies and procedures need to be revamped. Thank you. And we'll please take, a take look over at that. Uh, uh, the DWP. And thank you for thank passing you. that out to us. We appreciate that, Candido. Uh, Roland Guevara is next, and then John Cameron. Good morning. Good morning, and uh, thank you for uh, letting me speak here. Uh, I'm here only uh, to uh, reaffirm and underline uh, the. Uh, the non-existing support uh, for Mr. Candido Mares in his fight to rate for the ratepayers to pay less money. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. John Camera. Good morning, sir. Good morning, sir. Council members. I'm here to uh, support Candido Mares. Uh, he's a good uh, friend of mine. We've done a lot of good things in the community together. And I'm wearing this shirt, integrity is everything. And this is what I hope that our council aspires to, as well as the people of Los Angeles. Thank you. Appreciate your comments. That will close our general public comment for today. If we can go to the two items called special, please. Item 31 was called special by Council Members Hahn and Koretz. Okay. Ms. Hahn, item number uh, 31 is before us. And that came out of which committee? Did, this is actually a second read on an ordinance. Okay. Ms. Hahn, item 31 is before us. 
Well, uh, thank you, colleagues. I just called this special because I voted no uh, last time around. I, I, I stood up for people who I, I think are uh, the hardest hit. That's the elderly, the disabled. Uh, and I, I called it special because I want to still vote no. I understand from our budget folks that this uh, could put uh, a hole in our budget. But uh, again, I, I just feel this is the wrong time to get rid of the lifeline to people who most need it uh, in the city. And I didn't want to balance our budget on the backs of the elderly and the disabled uh, and those who uh, are in poverty. Thank you. Mr. Rosendahl. Is there, is there anyone here from sanitation? Because in that discussion, and really my empathy is with you, Ms. Hahn, on this in the context of those folks who can't afford it, but also I found um, four years ago, as Mr. Smith and I were on the Public Works Committee, uh, we talked about a pilot program where seniors um, could uh, put their um, refuge in one barrel uh, among three or four rather than separately, sort of pay as you throw or throw as you pay or something like that. And we talked about the potential of a pilot program. And so I, I want to know where we are in it, and I don't want it to fall through the black hole and be another four years before we actually go through a program. I've had people come up to me, especially seniors, who make very little refuge. I mean, they, they really are clean and neat. They're not as as wasteful, frankly, as, as some of us are. Uh, and they have said to me, can't we just have one can between three or four of us and therefore not have to, to, to be burdened with this expense? So I, I basically want to just feed off of Ms. Hahn's point and see where are we on this and what kind of relief can we give and how many people will be directly affected uh, frankly, by what we're planning to do today to obviously uh, meet our budget needs that we've agreed to uh, months ago to do this. Please. Uh, good morning. Alex Halubir of Sanitation. Uh, about several years ago, uh, Honorable Council Member Smith introduced the new LA, and in that one, really, he talked about the pay as you throw program, where residents who put 10 pounds out on the curb, that they can pay for the 10 pounds. They put 100, they pay for 100, just like you do in the water. We, we presented a couple of reports on that one. We looked throughout this country and overseas, and there's two types of systems. There's the volume-based system, which the Bureau of Sanitation utilizes, which basically you get your three containers, the 60, the uh, black, and the 90 green, and the 90 blue, as well as, you know, so if you have a horseman or you give you a brown. But this is the volume-based system that we have in the Bureau of Sanitation. Uh, for a truly uh, weight-based system, we look throughout this country, Councilman Rosenthal, as well as in Canada, there is not a single system that is used as a weight-based system. Uh, the only weight-based system that we were able to find is people buying plastic bags, putting their trash in them, and put them on the curb and manually collect it. That's the only weight-based system that we find for residential. Um, we believe the idea that Councilman Smith has introduced is a really great idea. Right now it's ahead of its time because there is no system in place that measures it that has to be passed, weight and measured. Like you go to the store and you buy something, you want to make sure that you're paying for that. If, you, if you're buying one pound of potatoes, you want to get one pound. And that's what the issue is with the containers. The weight of the containers and whatever you put in, there is not a single system that we found out for residential units. We found some for commercial scale, but those are really for businesses type. And so we're still working with manufacturers. We're trying to find a system that will work Currently, there is not one that we can. In addition, if you, somebody puts a container for weight, and we say, okay, what prevents other neighbors from putting the stuff in, into that container? And so that's what we've been looking at this one. We did have a report on, on the uh, volume base as well as the weight base system that was presented some time back. We'll be happy to su resubmit that report. Um, as for seniors, to be pulling uh, all their trash, maybe from the, from the same block or two blocks, bringing them to one location. Uh, there was a motion introduced last week by Councilman Reyes and Councilman Rosenthal, and we will be reporting back on that one, on finding a way where it will make it convenient for seniors, if that could work for them to be able to pile their trash. But on the pay-as-you-throw system, currently there is not a single system. We hope will be one. 
Okay. One in the future. I think the pay and then the pilot that uh, Mr. Reyes and I put forward, when will we get a report back on that? Because I'd like, people are coming to me wondering if they can get involved in that kind of collection. We, we can get back within the 60 days. Within 60 Thank days. You. Great. Great, great. Thank now, you, how Mr. many Rosenthal. people will uh, be in Can I ask you to press your, your button again? I'm sorry. We're just about That's a okay. minute and a half over. That's <laughs> All, right. Right. All right. Go ahead. Mr. Alicone is next and then Mr. LaBange. Council members, if, if we're trying to plug the budget gap with a cost that was spread across the board, that would be quite different than this particular increase. Uh, and I, I wouldn't be likely to, to uh, fight against it. Uh, but what we are doing is imposing a $12 a month uh, burden in the first year and a $25 a month burden in the second year on the disabled community and senior citizens. The community that is least able to be able to absorb these costs. And it's going to show up on their DWP bill. And if they get a two month bill like most of us do, uh, they're going to see a $50 increase in, in a couple of years. Um, that is a huge amount uh, for families that are eking out their existence right now. And so this is not about creating a new system. Uh, this is about spreading the burden fairly. I believe this is unfairly burdening our senior citizens and disabled community when we have had a pattern and practice of providing this service. Uh, so this is not an issue of finding a new system. This is an issue of where do you believe the burden should be placed when we are a short in our budget. I don't believe it should be placed on the senior citizens. I don't believe it should be placed on the disabled community. Mr. LeBonge is next, then Mr. Cardenas. Uh, what I would like to see the Bureau of Sanitation do is study this model. I think you have a situation that has to look at it. If I have a 30-gallon container, Mr. Kakorit has a 60-gallon container, is there any difference in price? Right now, no, actually, it's the same price. Okay, so that's something that you can look at uh, as that goes. Also, we should see how many people do use like just this yesterday all the green cans in the city aren't going to be able to carry the leaves that came from the trees on next week's collections or this week's collection because the debris load is much higher due to the heavy windstorm that we experienced in the last 48 hours so it's a very delicate thing how much would we as a council want to say and i know at water and power they have a volunteer uh, donation if you want to make to help seniors how much would we want to ask the people of Los Angeles to support for those who are really needy? Would those who are really needy would want to put an extra dollar on their bill to pay for people who are in need? I would rather go that way uh, to try to help. And then also working with the Department of Aging or whatever state agency to make sure uh, the people who are in need are absolutely in need. Because all these are from residential collections, correct? These are not from apartment buildings, correct? These are from properties, primarily single family properties. Primarily single family and some multifamily. But 95% single family, homeowner. About 70%. 70%, 30% is not. Where, where are that we are talking about four four plexes under eight or what's the number on those units? Yeah, it's basically four units and less. Four units or less. So it's a mom and pop possibly. I think there should be some study on it. I really, Bill, if you try to combine, I think everybody should have a container. Everybody should have a container, whether it's 30 gallons or 60. But maybe there needs to be a price that they could investigate it. But people do dump, and I hate when people dump whatever the reason is and uh, there's a need for a very effective sanitation department environmental department that cares for the environment of the street for the public health of the people so i want you to think outside the box and come back to us in a short period of time i don't like to raise anybody's especially those in great need but i also know there's a system now that we've transformed the system is that we're recovering the cost of the services I don't like the fact that there's two logs sitting out on the street that can't be picked up right now because we don't have the people to do it. We've got to find ways to do it 
and you have a, an opportunity here to create something. I would like to ask uh, Mr. Rosendahl, because you were the maker of the motion, that they include our deputies who are in the field, and maybe a little round table who may work closely and look statistically at state and other, uh, other uh, statistical data from the Department of Aging of where the most people in need are of the age group that we're focused on. Thank you very much. Mr. Cardenas. Um, how did the city come, when and how did the city come up with zero? How long has it been if you are low income and you qualify, you don't pay anything? When did that happen? Who was the magnanimous, was it the Pope that came and said we need to take care of poor people and the city of LA said hallelujah? What, what, what the heck happened? Why zero? Um, council member, it's, I don't have the data exact uh, initial ordinance, uh, just the most recent revision, which was in 2008. But the, um, this has been in effect for at least 15 to 20 years. Yeah, okay. Um, the reason why I ask that is because how did we come up with zero? Because the bottom line is, basically when we came up with zero on a fee for service, what we're basically saying is everybody else is able to afford picking up the tab for those households. And it's unfortunate that we came up with zero because now it seems to be like it's an ungodly thing for us to do to actually start charging poor people for picking up their trash, which is a service that costs the city money, correct? Correct. Okay, I mean, we don't, we don't pick up trash for free. We need trucks and drivers and mechanics and a place to put it and we have to pay in some cases we actually have to pay a tonnage fee to actually unload those trucks right that is correct sir. okay so the bottom line is there's no question that no matter who you are the city of los angeles is expending money to pick up your trash and dispose of it that is correct sir it is approximately 16.7 million that is budgeted in the current fiscal year the uh, estimated cost if there's no change in the um, number of participants or the structural lifeline would be uh, a cost of between 20 and a half to 21 million dollars this year to the general fund okay and if for some reason the city council decided to go backwards on its intent and commitment during the budget process to raise the fee from zero to charging people, mm -hmm. what would your department have to do? Well, in a, to, to put a change into effect, uh, we have worked with the Department of Water and Power. Um, uh, what is before you is a 35% charge that go into effect, um, and then subsequently there, there would be the okay, fee I, increase I get further. that, but the thing okay. is, what would happen if we thwarted that process and mm -hmm. say, don't go back to charging these people zero. Then, we would then have, what would the department have to do? Then the, the, the budget cost would not be, uh, the, the appropriation of the current year budget, the 16.7 million would not be sufficient to cover the cost of the program this year. We would need to see an increase in the appropriation of about $5 million approximately. So, so, so basically, you would have to charge everybody more than you're charging them now to subsidize people at zero, or you would have to figure out some way to cut back even further on your mechanics, on your drivers, somehow, some way, create more efficiencies. And over the last few years, have you been cutting back and creating more efficiencies already? Well, yes, Councilman. We have uh, found additional efficiencies in the program to contain costs. And that's, that's across all of our programs. Uh, but the appropriation I was referring to is actually a general fund appropriation for the program. Um, we are unable to spread the costs of the, uh, the subsidy to the other ratepayers on the salt waste charge. So it's a general fund appropriation. And my last point is this. For those of you who are wearing environmentalist on your sleeve, people on this council, charging zero is not a good idea because if you charge zero, very likely, whether people can afford anything more or not, very likely they're not going to pay much attention to recycling because it's all the same to them. But it is a big difference to everybody else if you care about the environment. Mr. Smith. Well, thank you. And I, I think we need to clarify one more time, and I think Tony touched on this, but Mr. Alcon's comments that we're trying to get money for the budget is absolutely wrong that we had increased the budget for this from what, 16 to 20 something million dollars last year? 16 to 24 million dollars. So we've increased, time. are you listening Janice? We've increased by eight million dollars the amount of money in the budget for this to support these people. 
What we did is we put a cap on it, so we've got to stop growing. We've been growing beyond our means, and we asked the department because it hadn't been checked in how long. We haven't gone back and verified any of these people's status. Ever. Ever. So we have people out there that are dead. We have people out there that have moved, people that are no longer qualified, and we've never asked them to prove it, and it's mm -hmm. address-based, correct? That is correct, sir. So in the history of this program, we've probably got 50% change or so, at least. We do have a change, yes. Yeah. The recertification effort had not been done, and uh, now that we have been going through the recertification effort, we are finding that uh, there have been uh, folks that have moved, there have been deaths, numerous changes have occurred. Yeah. So all we're doing is cleaning our system, folks. We've increased the funding. We're not, as Mr. Alcorn said, trying to get money for the budget. We actually put more money into it. We're not taking it away. We're not taking away anything other than we're saying to people, we can only afford so much, and if you're in that process, you're going to pay a little bit more because we have to spread the pain out, but we put more money into it. So we're not taking anything from people. We put more into it. It's just we can't put everything into it if we don't change the way we've done this billing system, and that's what we've asked the department to do, and that will take how long? We're planning to finish this uh, whole process, Councilman, by January of uh, 2011. Yeah. We'll start the uh, end of this year, December. So theoretically, I mean, it's possible that we could actually get into next year, and with the cap being at 23 million, find out there's so many less people that they could still get a subsidy, or we'd open the program up to new people? I mean, the city attorney could comment on this, but uh, right now the way the ordinance talk is about capping it about 59,011 yeah, residents who qualify. So if we lose 10, 20,000 of them, we could open the program up to the new people that really are qualified that are now locked out of the system. That's correct. Yes, that's yeah, correct. So I think the, the characterization that we're cruel-hearted budget analysts here trying to steal money for the budget is absolutely false. We put more money in it, we're making it a better program, we're taking people off it that don't belong on it, and probably then giving the opportunity to new people to come in that aren't crewing the system. This is the right thing to do, people. Mr. Alicorn. I, I, didn't, I didn't hear any characterizations of people being cold-hearted. Uh, I just heard Ms. Hahn and I say that if the choice is to take money uh, out of the pockets of senior citizens and the disabled, that's not a choice that I want to make. Uh, everybody can make whatever judgment they feel, but I just want to make it clear. I believe there are other options that spread the burden more effectively across the board instead of impacting this particular group of people that are least able to pay for it uh, in this particular way. Uh, nobody's criticizing any other council member here. You decide what you believe is to be correct. Uh, I don't want to put this burden on the senior citizens and the disabled. That is the last speaker on the queue. Uh, this is our second reading of the ordinance. Mr. Parks, did you want to speak on this? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'd just uh, like to reiterate what we did back in February. Uh, when we created this pro uh, program, and I think the issue is, as Mr. Smith said, not only did we cap it so that we would not go over the budgeted amount, mm -hmm. if you clean up the system and go from 100% uh, to 60% to 30%, more people actually can be served at a lower rate. And so no one is being harmed. The issue is the city can't afford to allow the subsidy to go willy-nilly and not have a cap on it. And so I think that's what we've asked you to do is to put a cap, clean up the system with the thought that if we capped it at, I believe, what, 23 million? Is that, is it 23? The, the cap is at uh, 16, 16 million, we went to 23. Correct. So the key, yeah, last year. That's okay. clear. So the key, the key is, is try to serve more people at a lesser rate. And again, if we don't do this as the ordinance was proposed in February, uh, then we have to find $16 million worth of cuts that will pay for this. And that means either furloughs, layoffs, or whatever else we do, whether it's uh, services at libraries, services at parks. So it's a matter of balancing where the $16 million, they just can't go into the deficit and not be paid. And so I'd ask that we uh, fulfill our commitment that we did in February, uh, that we go on with the program, that we encourage sanitation to keep validating the list so that we make sure that people that are getting the subsidy deserve the subsidy. And then as we get below 
the cap of $16 million, we can then start looking to add people into it. So I'd ask for an aye vote. Thank you. Uh, it's now time for a uh, vote on the second reading. Please prepare the roll. And tabulate the vote. Nine ayes, four noes. That is approved. Next item called special, please. Item 48 was called special by Councilmember Rosendahl. Mr. Rosendahl, item 48. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, could we ask uh, someone from the LAPD to come up for a quick second? Uh, colleagues, this is just a, a, an awareness moment I want you to know. There are 154 sworn personnel in the LAPD uh, who's, who are sitting in various jobs of 120 vacant civilian positions. 33 uh, of the officers are permanently light duty, 28 are temporary light duty, and 93 are full duty. So of the 93 full duty, I go through the whole process here, but just to put it in context, 47 full duty officers spend 100% of their time performing civilian duties. Okay? And we know a civilian is cheaper than a sworn officer. We know that their duties are including timekeeping, scheduling, supplies, data entry, answering phones, and analytical and administrative duties. We've been talking about this for quite a while, about how can we keep the civilians there. They're 70 cents on the dollar, if I'm not mistaken, compared to a sworn officer. But once again, in this report, we're bottom line saying that 47 full-time officers, uh, when you equate it all out, spend 100 percent of their time performing civilian duties. And there's another issue, but I know you, you can't really comment on it, is that we put 90 additional officers in the Metropolitan uh, Detention Center. My bottom line is this. We want sworn officers out protecting and serving. We don't need them to do clerical. It's cheaper for us to have clerical. Once again, why are we in this kind of a quandary? Uh, Francois Gardier, personnel director for LAPD. Um, we find ourselves in this position because of uh, ERIP, um, the budget, uh, not being able to fill positions. Um, we do go to the Manage Hiring Committee periodically to get positions unfrozen. Uh, but we're only getting positions frozen that are absolutely critical. So a lot of these vacancies we simply cannot fill. Why can't we change ourselves around and fill it? Because I'd rather have 47 civilians there rather than 47 uh, fully able uh, sworn officers. Well, in order for that to happen permanently, or at least for these uh, 120 positions, uh, we would have to get the positions unfrozen and have those positions remain unfrozen so that in the future if somebody left through retirement, termination, transfer, or whatever the Sounds case. Great. Why don't we unfreeze them? Sounds great. What do we need to do to unfreeze them so we can do that so we don't put a sworn officer in a civilian job? Well, that's something that we would have to pose to the Managed Hiring Committee. Um, uh, over the years we have said that if you unfreeze a position and you put a civilian in that position and then the civilian leaves for some reason, the position then gets frozen again. So now we're back in the same place we were. So it, it, for this to work, we would have to get those positions unfrozen and them stay unfrozen. So should the position become vacant, we would be able to just Fine, fill it Mr. again. Parks, can we do that? We can do that if you have the millions of dollars to do that. The issue is that uh, we cut civilians in the police department uh, so that we could continue hiring sworn at 99.63 which seems to be sacred, uh, but the issue is unless you're going to either cut back on sworn hiring and use the money for civilians, or you find new money, they can't hire the civilians. And so that's why uh, I believe, what is it, 45 sworn? 47, 47, 47 full time. Is that in addition to what was in the newspaper recently about opening the jail? Yes. This, yes, this is in addition. That's, so the, the jail is 90. 90 additional. And additional. But that's the problem that we have by cutting civilians. And what we said during the budget, if you keep cutting civilians, eventually you're going to pay for them double by putting sworn officers in civilian jobs. Right. So until the council makes a decision that 9963 is not sacred, and we use money that's in the sworn account and hire civilians, or we find money for civilians and keep hiring sworn, either one, you need money. And the key is you can unfreeze them, but they're already... If I'm not mistaken, the police department is double-digit millions in deficit in the first six months of this fiscal year. You just add to the deficit and cut it somewhere else down the road. So without money, they're doing the best they can. 
I'm just curious, Mr. President, if, if in the dialogue here, can we not in this budget process unfreeze civilian jobs so that we don't put sworn officers in the civilian job and save that money? Can we somehow do a motion, do a collective strategy or something? Because I'm tired of sworn healthy officers in civilian jobs. You can do a motion, but if you don't have the money, the motion is meaningless. But it's cheaper. It's only cheaper if you have the money. If you don't have the funds for the civilian positions, then you can't hire them. And the only way you're going to get the money from the civilian positions is either stop hiring sworn or take this money from other accounts and other departments to hire civilians. You can't just open up the positions and say hire and create a bigger deficit. Well, I'm frustrated by this. If we could find a, a way among our geniuses here, 15 of us, to stop this strategy, I would love to us to go forward where we hire civilians for civilian jobs and let sworn officers do what they're, you know, delegated to do, which is protect and serve us. So, Mr. President, is there something we can do about this going forward? I think uh, Mr. Park said you can introduce a motion, but so I think his point is that you would have to retire some police officers. If you're, if you're saying one is cheaper than the other, you have to get rid of the ones that are more expensive. So that means reducing the overall police department force of the sworn force in order to hire those civilians. Otherwise, you keep them and you move them someplace else and you're adding new expense. So, well, anyhow, but if you'd like to introduce I just wanted to bring it up to because I think it's a quandary we have to get out of and we can't Absolutely. do this. Sure. Thank you. Mr. Koretz. Yeah, I think I've been talking about this issue from the day I got here, um, and I referred to it always the same way. If we have 300 civilians, if we have 300 civilian jobs being done by sworn officers, we have 300 phantom officers because their training and their extra expense is absolutely useless to us. So at some point we have to recognize, identify the number of sworn officers doing civilian jobs, and through attrition, cut those jobs out and replace them with civilians. Uh, I assume we could do that. I know the department will scream and yell, but it's only a PR issue. It's not a real enforcement issue. We're not getting any enforcement out of those 300 people or 100 people, whatever the number is, doing desk jobs. At some point, we have to recognize that, cut those officers, not cut the money out of the department so they have the money to hire the civilians to do the job and they have money left over to actually f fill in some of their shortfall. Uh, it's the only way that makes sense. I'm not sure how we structure that motion, but I think at some point we have to stop worrying about the PR and actually do what makes sense for our budget and for our city. Thank you. Mr. LaBonge. Yeah, I think, uh, Mr. Roosevelt, on your remarks, you asked, you used the term, it began with a G, uh, if you remember. Yeah, yeah, so I'm glad. To, no, 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 I just think what we have to do, it's an absolute change, we have to rethink governance, if we choose to do that. And I think someone's got to stand up and say, I want in my district a police division that is staffed uh, by a lot of civilians and a complement of officers. And, but, Will you be successful in doing what is the challenging thing at most is confronting danger the way officers have to do in the streets? I would love us to rethink many of our processes. I would love us to rethink our street cleaning. We have our storm drains that are cleaned by sanitation, but the gutters cleaned by street services. Why not follow the trash in one agency? I would love to have more civilians. I'd love to see people like our deputies, our field deputies who have great skills and knowledge working side by side, which they do with senior lead officers, but in a more formal way. So, Jerry Miller, I want you to think about uh, rethinking what would be the ideal 2015 civilian police ratio for uh, 180,000 people in the city of Los Angeles to create what is a model division. And I think, Mr. Parks, if we have a model that we can look for in the future and know what it costs, maybe we can think that way. But at this time, I don't think you could change at the moment, though I do believe the contributions that civilians give to law enforcement is so key. But also, I know how important it is to have those who meet danger face to face immediately uh, in doing that. And the last question, how many officers, because of service to the city, have uh, special uh, detail because they're not...
qualified to work in a radio car anymore. Are there a number they could still? I know the fire department has light duty officers, I think they call them. Uh, there are approximately 400 officers that are permanently restricted. Okay, so that's a big, 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 big number. So and that's an important number because they serve the city well, yet they have to be restricted because of some injury ac across their career, and they're to be respected for that. Thank you uh, very much for your comments. Thank you, Mr. Rizzo. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. And I submitted this motion to have precisely this type of discussion. And I think Mr. Koretz is right on. If we continue to stay on this goal of hiring 10,000 more officers, but at the same time we're funneling officers to do civilian jobs, we're not really fulfilling what we're stating to do. Because what we really want to do is put more officers on the street. That's how we're selling it to the public. We say, help us hire 10,000 more officers, officers so that we put more officers on the street. But we're not really doing that. We're putting them in civilian jobs. We're doing that more and more. So I think if we look at a model, Mr. LaBange, where we could take some of the money that we're allocating to hire new officers, perhaps hire more civilian people to do those jobs, at the end of the day, we're going to get what we want. Given the limited dollars that we have, we're going to be able to put more officers in the street. And I think that's what Mr. Koretz is getting at. And I think in next year's budget deliberations, that's really what we ought to be looking at, to see how we could fill more jobs and civilian jobs with civilians that cost us less, and we're able to put more officers in the street with the money that we otherwise would use to hire. There is no money, but there is money in hiring more officers. Perhaps we need to look at how we change that formula so we put more officers on the street. That's the goal. The goal is not just to get more officers for the sake of getting more officers, but how do we get more officers in the street. There is a formula that could do that, but we need to look at that in next year's budget deliberations. Mr. Parks. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I'm, there's kind of music to my ears to hear people talk about maybe a balanced hiring. We've only been saying that for about three years, but the problem is every time there's a class to be hired, there's a generally a 14 to 1 vote to hire them. So you either have to do it on either side. You have to stop hiring, which we have classes now scheduled. One just started in November. There's about four or five classes scheduled for next year. So you have an opportunity to save several million dollars on if attrition requires the hiring, not to hire between January and June. And with that non-hiring, you could move that money into civilian hiring and not put 90 people from the field into the jail and not to have 47 positions out of the field. And we're not talking about light duty. It's within your purview to do it within this budget. If you choose to alter the current budget, it takes eight votes or 10 votes, depending on if the mayor vetoes it, that you can do that today. The key is whether you have the will to do it, and we've ignored it each and every time it's come up, that every time there's a class to be hired, we hire it, and we go blindly through, and we keep cutting civilians, and we've been advised over and over and over again, if you keep cutting civilians, you're going to eventually get to the point, not only in the police department, but in the fire department. Firefighters do not fix trucks. Pretty soon that equipment will wear down, and you will not be able to get... The civilians are not there, the uh, mechanics. All that's going to come to a screeching, screeching halt, and you're going to have the full level of sworn personnel, but not enough civilian support to cause them to be effective. So within the budget today, if you truly want to address that, there's at least four or five classes January to June that you can alter that dollar allocation and turn it into civilians. If you don't choose to do it, then we will keep hiring police officers to that magical 99.63. Mr. Cardenas. <clears throat> Mr. Parks, I want to uh, thank you for um, explaining very uh, carefully the policy decisions that we've made as a body and the mantra that the mayor has been saying since he ran for office that his goal was to have 10,000 officers. It's unfortunate that hopefully it's not lost on the people listening and the people are in these chambers that to just claim a particular number of sworn officers is one thing. And perhaps for the campaign trail that's something appropriate. But when it comes to budgeting for the city of Los Angeles, 
what we need to understand is what is the right number of officers that we need to have the level of public safety that we are supposed to afford our citizens, yet at the same time making sure that those officers are properly supported, which in this case means how many civilian people are supporting our officers and what is the proper balance. And I think that I wanted to co compliment Councilmember Bernard Parks because he has been very calm and very forthrightly reminding us about the basic reality of the budget numbers and how we're going to find ourselves in a quandary and how we're going to be lying to the public by saying we have 10,000 officers but the public doesn't have 10,000 officers on the streets of Los Angeles. I don't think that the public expected the city of Los Angeles to brag about having 10,000 officers and keeping 10,000 officers on the force, yet at the same time the reality is that we're not experiencing 10,000 officers worth of public safety on the streets. And that goes to Mr. Parks's is comments that he's been saying for over three years. Are we going to make budget sense or are we just going to play to the public and try to convince them that we're doing the right thing when in reality item number 48 on the on the, the council floor this morning really exposes the fact that we are not being honest with the constituents and the constituents deserve to know how many officer hours did we have four years ago with X number of officers on the street how many officers did we have the next year and the next year how many officers do we have on the street on any given day in this city rather than saying how many officers are reporting for work and cleaning the bathrooms or doing paperwork or painting the walls or whatever it is that they're doing because we have depleted ourselves of all these other professionals whose job is truly to do those other things. Right. And there's a fundamental problem, whether it's business or in the public sense, why are you going to pay somebody $50 an hour to do a $10 an hour job? Why are you going to have somebody go through the academy and be sworn and have this special duty and then have them not do that special duty, yet we're paying them for that special duty? That, ladies and gentlemen, is not the truth. That, ladies and gentlemen, is bad government. That, ladies and gentlemen, has to stop. Thank you. We've got Mr. Rizar and Lavans on the queue thus far, and then uh, this is the last item on today's agenda, folks. Mr. Rizar. Thank, thank you very much, and I appreciate those comments, Mr. Karnas, but the discussions that were held before in the previous budget deliber deliberations were all about not hiring to the 10,000 level because we don't have the money. But there was never a subsequent conversation back then saying, but we still need to do these civilian jobs within LAPD. Whatever proposal comes forward, it has to be coupled together. It's a, we have to say, there's a need to fill civilian jobs in LAPD. Let's fill them. But we have a hiring freeze. Our, our committee that our committee that discusses uh, I don't know what's it called uh, that, that makes exceptions. They can make those exceptions for that civilian jobs, and at the same time realize that any savings that we can be had from not hiring 10,000 officers should go to those civilian jobs that need to be had in the LAPD. That conversation happens needs to happen together because otherwise if we say we don't want to hire 10,000 officers because we don't have the money, that, that's not going to go anywhere. We need to have that discussion coupled with a civilian need within LAPD. Uh, Mr. Smith for the first time. I'm just going to ask one simple question because I, I had breakfast with the Chief of Police yesterday. Uh, you're talking about civilian stuff but as far as the jail goes, you've talked to the Chief on the jail issue? I have not personally, no. Okay, well, I'll just give you this comment. He said, if anyone wants to ask me what is the best plan, it is not what we're doing, but it's better than all the other options on the table. He doesn't like it one bit, but it's the only option available that makes the most sense. We'll have that discussion later. But I, you, a lot of you brought that up, the jails today. That's not, that's not on the agenda today on this item. That's not the jail. So we'll have that discussion later. Thank you. Mr. LeBonge, Mr. Cardenas, sorry, Mr. Alicone for the first time, and then Mr. LeBonge. Sorry, Tom. Because I want to talk about we're, we're, we're essentially talking about uh, 47 full-time equivalents. But these, these aren't uh, like 47 full-time positions in 47 different locations. These are, these are many positions, more than 47, that are spread out all over the department and somebody's so it's not like you can hire a police service representative 
for, for 40 hours and stick them in one of these slots because half the time may be uh, downtown and the other half might be in the valley. So I, I, I think that while the numbers that the CLAs report uh, are interesting and we want to try and hone in on maximizing the use of our police officers in the street, uh, I, I'm, I'm not getting a clear picture from the numbers I see here as to what extent, what would, what would it cost us to hire 47 full-time employees. Uh, I still don't think it would cover the work that these people are doing because it, it's in little bits. There are 93 officers performing uh, 47 civilian equivalents. So that means there's bits and pieces all over the department, and it's not like you can just hire 47 people to fill those jobs because uh, we would be wasting money. We'd probably have to f hire 93 full-time uh, positions to do 47 people's work, and that's not efficient either. So um, what you see at first is, you know, this is, this is the kind of thing that is dangerous uh, in government because people will immediately say this is waste and, and there's probably some that can be trimmed. Uh, in terms of the light duty folks, you know, I absolutely believe it's cheaper to keep them on the job than to uh, send them off, off the job um, for a lot of reasons. But uh, with regard to the 93, I think that we need more information before we start, um, before we start uh, uh, jumping to conclusions about, about uh, uh, using these uh, 93 officers, um, of which 67 of them are spending a little bit of their, some portion of their time uh, in civilian duties. I, I just, I, I don't think this is indicative of, of a massive problem. I think it's something that we should work on to improve, but I don't think it's a massive problem. Thank you, Mr. Alicone. Mr. Labanche. Yeah, I just wanted to say, uh, it's a great opportunity that we have to have light duty officers in a variety of roles. I would not like to see any people pushed off for a variety of reasons, so to find them roles. Again, what we need to do, members, not today, but soon, look at what is the model that we want. What, are, what kind of service does the police station in a community, the police division in a community, and then you have the administrative roles of a variety of divisions, what is their function and role, and how do they do it? In a community police station, how can we have more civilians to support police officers? We do not have enough as it is right now, and it's a gamble every day because an earthquake's going to come and join with the fire department. The police department is going to be first responder. Those first responders are going to deal with those issues. So I would just like to ask us, and I may do it formally, uh, Mr. Miller has asked that we rethink what we need to do if we look at everybody. As a football team, a coach looks at his 53 members of a football team in the National Football League, they look at each position and how many they have. Let's look at what is the ideal per population for an area and what we could do and then try to work to that goal. Because what is interesting about being here for many years is you hear these same arguments. And I remember two two or three previous uh, council members of, uh, of a particular district would be asking this all the time about civilianization, civilianization. I think we should look what the model is and then work to the model because we're never going to achieve it unless we work to a model because a model is like a game plan. A game plan gives you a, a course which you could get victory. And I want to know how does it feel being here in the city council today, officer? I am I'm pleased. I'm, you, I'm just, just wonderful. Have you been here before? A few times. A few times. Good. Where, where are you assigned? I'm the personnel director. I run personnel division for LAPD. For, what's your rank? I am a police administrator. Good. Thank you very much. How You're many welcome. civilians in your division? Uh, about 80. 80. 80. It's more, more civilians than more officers, right? Uh, primarily civilian, yes. Primarily. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Cardenas. Our next speaker? Uh, thank you. I just, I just wanted to make sure that I asked Council Member Wiesad, um to clarify about the 10,000 officers in, that he referred to, and I think him and I are in, in agreement that what we need to do is fund the department so that they can appropriately do all of the sworn work that needs to be done and all the civilian work that needs to be done and look at that in a way that 
creates the kind of environment for the department that they're appropriately funded at the proper rate, not necessarily focusing on whether or not we have 9,963 officers. By the way, it's not 10,000 officers that was funded in the budget. It was 9,963, pretty darn close to 10,000. But anyway, my, my point is this. What we need to do as a legislative body is we need to look at the fact that we acquiesced to the idea that some magic number of 9,963 offers needed to be maintained, but the word maintenance to be maintained was missing in the policy. What we need to do is make sure that we fund the department so that the department can maintain the department at the proper level, so that it can have people fixing the cars, so that when an officer shows up for work, he or she isn't sitting around waiting for a vehicle that's not ready to roll out, so they can get out there and protect the public. That there are people who are actually typing and inputting reports or what have you, so that we don't have officers sitting at a desk, what a civilian should and legally can do having an officer do that because that officer is not out on the streets protecting the public. That's what we need to do, ladies and gentlemen. So I hope that this is a reminder to me and to all of you and to all of us that next year when we do the budget, let's not look at a magic number of officers, but let's look at what does the department need in order for it to be budgeted appropriately and respectfully and efficiently in this budget environment? and then go from there. Because I agree with Councilmember Parks that continuing to hire at the rate at which people are retiring from the department, I think we're the only large city in the country who's doing that. I think we're the only large uh, city in the country who's doing that. And almost every city throughout the nation, not only are they not hiring to attrition, they unfortunately actually had to lay off officers. I'm not saying we should lay off officers, Thank God we have enough attrition going on in our city that it's my understanding, Mr. Smith, you're a lot closer to the department than I am. It's about 250 or so, give or take, officers who, who leave on the natural on a given year. Yeah, 200 now. So somewhere 200 plus officers would actually say, thank you very much. My career is over. I'm stepping away. I'm no longer going to show up to work and put on my uniform and protect the public. If we stopped hiring to that number, we could actually backfill the civilians and have a properly funded department that will actually function efficiently and actually keep the public safety level at its proper level. We missed that opportunity this time, and once again, I want to thank Councilmember Bernard Parks because he's not even saying, I told you so. He's just saying, thank you for allowing the debate. I hope everybody's listening. We need to do the right thing. That's what we're elected for. Mr. Wesson. Any objection to moving the previous question? There's an objection, so it requires a vote. It is not a debatable thing, but a, a no vote means debate will continue. A yes vote is to end the debate. Please open the roll. You can still submit a motion written either way, but don't worry. I, and Mr. Rosendahl wants people to know he wants to make a motion. Please. Okay, Mr. Wesson removes the, the, the motion, then Mr. Rosendahl. Thank you very much, and I, I appreciate this healthy discussion here. It would have been a sleeper just note and file on consent. The reality is we have to deal with the sacred number of 9963. If it's so sacred, why are we putting full-time, able-bodied officers into civilian jobs? So let's deal with the reality where the rubber is now hitting the road. We need to unfreeze these civilian positions so that we don't have able-bodied officers in these civilian positions, and we need to maintain the safety on the streets. So I want to put a motion here to come back with a report back that outlines these positions in detail, the rank of the officers there, what the civilian is making and what their job is, uh, so that we can unfreeze these civilian positions within the budgets we have and not be so sacred about 900, uh, 900, 9,963. If they're sworn officers on the beat, hallelujah. But if we know, and we know for a fact here right now, that 47 full-time officers spend 100% of their time doing civilian duties. This is unacceptable. So this motion is to explore it all out, lay it all out, so it can be brought back to us and see what kind of options we would have to unfreeze these civilian positions. I have a second. Mr. Smith is seconding it, and Mr. Smith. Reyes said he was Mr. Mr. Parks. Okay. 
I'm not going to say that, Tony. But uh, let me just say this, colleagues, is that, uh, and I just want to respond to Mr. Uh, Alakon's comments. Uh, you know, one of the things that's critical in this report is that it shows that 120 vacant civilian positions are being covered by 154 sworn officers. And although 154 sworn officers may be spending a portion of their time, it still is 120 civilian positions they're covering. The other thing that's important in the report, if you read through what they're doing, you will find that almost every one of those jobs used to be done by sworn, they were turned into civilians, and now they're being uh, filled by sworn again. So it's clear at some point in our history that the city council believe that civilian employees should be doing subpoena control, they should be doing property dispo, they should be doing uh, PSR work, the uh, police service rep, to bring sworn back into those positions basically is ignoring the civilianization, costing you at least 40 to 50 percent more money. And even though the salaries with new officers might be similar to the salary of civilian employees, their overhead on their pension is significantly higher. So I would say that, uh, again, we have the ability to do this, and these discussions were held in budget and finance about what the impact of civilian losses would be. We saw it with the fire department. Many of the people you may remember, the six foot seven guy that showed up, that's a mechanic, that said, I can't, you won't get trucks out if you don't hire mechanics. We saw civilians come in here over and over in the budget saying how it would impact the sworn departments if you didn't hire them. And so again, we could alter that by changing the dynamics of the budget if you moved money out of the sworn account, but it's got to be money tagged to these positions. If you choose not to do that, these kinds of decisions we made, whether it's to jail, whether it's uh, PSRs or whatever, that's the only way they're going to run the department is to move sworn into critical civilian jobs. And so, Thank you, Mr. Parks. That's our last speaker. If that motion is, is accepted, we'll make sure we ag agendize that and uh, we'll refer that, excuse me, to public safety and to budget and finance. And let's go ahead and open the roll. Close the roll and tabulate the vote. 13 ayes. All right. And that is the last item called special. At, at the record reflected 1120, we dispense with both of the items called special for today. Let's go ahead and uh, next order of business, please. Council has motions for posting and referral. Those are posted and referred. There's an excuse on the desk. Council Member Alicon requests be excused February 1st, 2nd, and 4th for personal business that meets council policy. Mr. Alicon is excused. And that clears the desk. Any announcements, colleagues? If we don't have any announcements, do we have any adjourning motions today? Seeing none, uh, we, you do have an adjourning motion? Okay. Please, uh, if I could ask everybody in council chambers to rise for our adjourning motions, please. Ms. Hahn. Thank you. Uh, colleagues, I actually have three this morning. Uh, the first one I'd like to, to adjourn in the memory of is Ciro Ferrigno, uh, a lifelong resident of San Pedro who recently passed away at the young age of 47. Um, Ciro was a dedicated family man, a local commercial fisherman for the past three decades aboard the Ferrigno Boy. He was a great leader in the fishing industry who dedicated himself to continuing uh, the fishing industry and the legacy of his father. Um, he survived by the love of his life, Tina, and his four children, Nicholas, Christina, Michelle, and Ciro Jr. He survived by his mother, Nicolina Ferrigno, brothers Joey, Sal, Leonard, and sister Maria. He prided himself on being a great husband and father and cherished the moments in life with his wife and children. He was a loving, caring, and generous man who touched the lives of many in San Pedro and the entire fishing industry, and he'll be greatly missed. Funeral services were held uh, yesterday at the Holy Trinity Church in San Pedro. I'd also like us to adjourn the memory of Bert uh, Tufile, uh, this was a sad accident the other uh, night uh, at the port on November 4th. He was tragically killed. He was only 55 years old, and he was crushed to death uh, when two trucks collided uh, inside a marine terminal uh, at Pier A over in the port of Long Beach. But it reminds us 
uh, how dangerous the work is for the men and women who uh, keep that cargo moving. We always talk about the international trade industry. We talk about all the issues surrounding uh, goods movement in California. Uh, but sometimes we forget about the men and women that actually move the cargo on the docks. It's very dangerous out there. Uh, and uh, this is another example of someone who lost their life uh, for that industry. He was raised in Samoa. He was a resident of Carson. He became a longshore casual uh, in 2004 and uh, he was a registered in Class B in 2007. He was a member of the ILWU for seven years. He'll always be remembered for his passion of playing the guitar, uh, praising music, and as the band leader and lead vocalist for Island Royalty. He survived by his loving wife of 30 years um, they Lily, three sons, Mays, Angelo, and Blake, two daughters, Jasmine and Jade, and three grandsons, Jared, Trent, and Jordan. Uh, may he rest in peace, and we thank him for uh, his service out on the docks. And my last one, colleagues, is uh, a friend of mine, George Becker, uh, passed away November 3rd. He was 85, uh, born and raised in Los Angeles. He graduated from Cathedral High School. He served in our U.S. Navy during World War II. Uh, after his discharge. He worked for our own uh, Department of Water and Power um, and uh, working his uh, way up to electrical line foreman. He retired in 1980 from that department. He was a dedicated family man, he was an active citizen, uh, loved his country. He loved Los Angeles. He was an active member of the community of Harbor City and he rarely missed a neighborhood council meeting. That's the last time I saw George, even when he was ill. Uh, he was at that neighborhood council meeting, adding his voice uh, to caring about uh, what happens in the neighborhood. He was affectionately nicknamed the Mayor of Green Meadows. That was the housing tract where he and his wife lived. Um, he survived by his wife of 62 years, Jackie. He had four children, Jeffrey, Carl, Lauren, and Eric. Um, he's also survived by eight grandchildren uh, and his younger sister, Pat O'Brien. Their services uh, were being held this this morning. He'll be greatly missed. Great community member. Great uh, member of our city family. Uh, may you rest in peace, George Becker. Thanks for all you did for all of us. Thank okay. you, Mr. Ace. We'll second that. Thank you. Mr. Kukorin. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I'd like uh, to ask that the City Council adjourn in memory of Eleanor Dodigan, who passed away at the age of 89. Uh, Eleanor's uh, parents were survivors of the Armenian Genocide, who came to California and settled in Reedley, California, near Fresno, where Eleanor was born in 1921. Uh, Eleanor then came to Los Angeles to study at USC uh, as a music major and went on to pursue a graduate degree in education and then went on to teach uh, for uh, 10 years. Uh, Eleanor was one of the most ardent supporters and partners of her daughter and her daughter, her daughter Donnell and her daughter's efforts to create a Hollywood museum to allow people in Los Angeles and throughout the world to understand the storied and treasured history of, of Hollywood here in Los Angeles. And uh, because of Eleanor's work and Donnell's work, uh, that dream became a reality with the creation of the Hollywood Museum in the Max Factor building, one of the great treasures. Of, uh, of Mr. Garcetti's district, the 13th district, uh, and it's because of her efforts that we're all able to enjoy that now and, and, uh, and better understand our own history and the history of Hollywood. Uh, Eleanor Dadigan imparted a strong sense of values of community service to her daughter, and uh, we're all benefiting from uh, those teachings and those lessons. And so uh, I'd like to ask that we adjourn in Eleanor's memory. She survived by her only daughter, Donnell, and we send uh, our condolences to, to her and her family. Thank you. I'd like to uh, co-present that with, with uh, Mr. Krikorian. I spoke with Danelle just after uh, her mom's passing, and, and her mother was a friend of mine as well, and, and uh, an amazing woman. Um, Danelle uh, described her as a mother who told her to pursue her dreams. And as Mr. Krikorian said, uh, the beautiful Hollywood Museum was that dream. Um, it's not a money-making venture. In fact, they've poured a lot of money into that in the family to give something to uh, those who come to Hollywood seeking that amazing history and that amazing legacy. Um, and they've just done a tremendous job. It's a beautiful, beautiful museum that reflects the, the beauty of the two women who are most involved with it. Um, Danelle, for, for a number of years, was taking care of her mother who had been um, fighting um, uh, to uh, extend 
her incredible life here on earth and uh, ultimately um, was taken from denial and taken from the community. But uh, she is somebody who had an incredible um, daughter, was an incredible mother, and I know that Danelle and the rest of, of Eleanor's fans in Hollywood grieve her her passing. Mr. LaBunch? Yeah, I'd just like to second that. In, in, in uh, these latter years, as Mr. Garcetti spoke so eloquently of, as you did, Paul, there was Danelle with her mother, always at every community event, always uh, helping her and, and giving the joy of life. God rest her memory. I'd like to second that. Thank you. Absolutely. Any other adjourning motions? If not, Mr. Clerk, if you could.